All right. Good morning, London. I'm very excited to be here. I hope you've all had a great morning so far. So, is anyone in here expecting to hear about async and await in JavaScript? Ha! <laughs> I'm sorry to disappoint you, but there will be no such thing as JavaScript in here. I'm going to talk about async and await in .NET and how we can be more efficient. So, I want to go back to the basics and look at what is asynchronous programming all about. How do we apply that in our programs? And what do we need to do to avoid potential deadlocks and problems? Before we get into that, I want to introduce myself. I'm Philip Eckberg. I'm a Microsoft and Xamarin MVP, which is pretty much the same thing now that they're kind of the same company, which means that I go around to places and talk about technology. Doesn't necessarily mean that I know how to do things in the real world. So if you do have any questions, feel free, feel free to ping me on Twitter, send me an email. Um, I've also written a book called C Sharp Smorgasbord, and since we pretty much got a full room in here, and it's been five years since I released the book, I'm going to give everyone in here a free digital copy. Just take a photo and ping me on Twitter, and I'll sort you out. And you also have to leave a green thing out there. <laughs> nah, it's fine. If you do want to leave a red note out there, please let me know why. All right, so asynchronous programming. What is that all about? You know, every time I go into a project, and I try to apply asynchronous patterns, or I help other developers apply asynchronous programming, I feel like a firefighter. Because every time I add something asynchronous, every time I change something to be more asynchronous, it's a fire starting somewhere else. I fix one problem, and then all of a sudden, I have other issues in my pro program. Asynchronous programming is pretty much all about allowing us to write better applications. And we have tools to do that in .NET. And we're going to explore those tools. And hopefully, by the end of this session, we'll have a better understanding of what it's all about and how we can build better apps in .NET. So why do we bother writing applications and using asynchronous principles? It's pretty simple. We can build applications that behave better. One of the most obvious reasons for myself is that I want to avoid unreliable applications. An unreliable application could, for instance, like in this case here, be an Android application that behaves weirdly. You press a button, and all of a sudden, the application thinks that it's crashing. In this case here, I'm hogging a lot of resources on the UI thread, so the OS thinks that the application is crashing. And we can apply asynchronous principles in order for us to build better apps and avoid this problem, which pretty much boils down to improving user experience. So, you know, I want to build apps that behave better. I want to build apps that are faster. I want to build apps that are more efficient, both as a developer and for the end user. So we kind of want to avoid this crashing application here. But one of the most common reasons for applying asynchronous principles is to leverage all the available resources on our devices. So on my machine here, I got four cores with hyper-threading on, which kind of gives me eight cores. I want to leverage all that. And then I have a lot of memory. I have 32 gigs of RAM, out, and I want to be able to leverage all that, as well as my super fast SSD drive. If I load a file from disk into memory, I want my application to not lock up, but allow me to get notified when that data is available. So leverage, leveraging all these resources means that we need to be able to use our CPU as well as our memory, which kind of boils down to CPU and I.O. bound operations. In .NET, it's super simple to kind of group these two together. Welcome. But what we want to do is that we want to divide these two into different buckets. So CPU-bound operations, that's more or less about parallelization. We want to parallelize our problems, which means that we divide them into smaller pieces and solve them in smaller chunks. For CPU-bound operations, it's like loading things from the disk, adding things to the database going off to the web and doing some calls. Those two are totally different concepts. But in .NET, we kind of use them together using the task parallel library and the parallel extensions. So there's a very thin line between working in parallel and working with asynchronous programming. But we can use these two concepts together. So a lot of the time, we go off and we fire off an asynchronous operation. In this case here, I have a mobile application. I want to start some work. I press a button. And that goes off and runs something in parallel. It could be that it's solving a problem. It could be sending emails. It could be doing a lot of things. But the idea is that I start off an operation. When that operation is done, I get notified that something is completed. 
So I like to use an example from my book where I talk about how I can improve boiling eggs, which is funny because I don't even eat eggs, but somehow I want to improve that process for other people. So think about having a bunch of eggs that you want to boil on your stove. You have a lot of pots, and the more pots you add, the more eggs you can boil in parallel. Makes sense, right? So how do I make that process asynchronous? I take an egg timer, I set that to eight minutes, I put it down, and once that egg timer goes off, I can go back and take care of the eggs. I get a notification that the eggs are now available for me to take care of. Meanwhile, that asynchronous process is going on, I can go ahead and clean the kitchen, I can prepare my bacon, I can do other things. So while I'm parallelizing the egg boiling, I can have that as an asynchronous process by setting an egg timer. And if we translate that into code, it could look something like this here. I could start off an asynchronous operation by using the task parallel library, which then goes off and runs something in parallel. Now, you wouldn't always do this looking like this here, but this is just a, an example of how you would translate that into code. Let's not get ahead of ourselves. Let's talk about how we go from being synchronous to being more asynchronous. It's all about taking an application that's synchronous today, and we want to improve that to be more asynchronous. So what, what does that mean? It means that we want to go from a blocking application to a non-blocking application. The example that I showed before with the mobile app crashing, that's a blocking application. We're doing something on the UI thread. We want to avoid heavy lifting on our main thread or UI thread in the application in order for us to be able to let the user do other things. If we go back and talk about the egg boiling process, I want to mention something called never block your asynchronous operations. Blocking an asynchronous operation is like, if we talk about that egg boiling process, I take the egg timer, I take it in my hand, I put on my blindfold myself, I put on a headphone so I can't hear anything, and I just put the egg timer in front of me and wait for it to go off. But how will I know that the egg timer goes off if I'm blindfolded and can't hear anything? That's the same thing as blocking our asynchronous operations. So we want the asynchronous operation to be able to allow us to tell us when it's done, and we don't want to block that from being able to do so, so we can do other things. So most of the times we talk about going from blocking apps to non-blocking apps, which means that we want to take this application here and we want to translate that into something that's a lot better, which means that we introduce another type of blocking. We block the UI from input, but we allow the user to get notified that it's currently working on some data. And we can use these principles like asynchronous programming and parallelization to do things faster, quicker, and do it in the background and show the user a loading indicator. I'm not saying that blocking the UI in either of these ways is a better approach, but it's certainly better not crashing the app, right? In the left example here, the OS thinks that we're doing so much work on the UI thread that it's thinking that the application is crashing. It could, of course, have crashed in the other example as well because we don't know what's happening in the background thread. If the background thread is crashing that we're running work on, we'll see the loading indicator forever. But as a user, I'm more or less, you know, I'm leaning towards clicking, please close my app, rather than when I see a loading indicator, I tend to wait a little bit longer. So being able to apply these principles with asynchronous programming, it's pretty much all about allowing the user to get a better experience. And we can do that by introducing the task parallel library. How many of you have used the, the task parallel library today? So almost everyone. How many of you have had a deadlock? Okay, so no one pretty much raised their hands. A deadlock is just around the corner. I promise you that you have apps that have a deadlock in them because it's super simple to get that happening, especially when we introduce async and await. You know, efficiency is not only about building apps that behave quicker, it's also about building apps that are maintainable. We have two different types of efficiency. We can be efficient as developers and we can have an app that behaves efficiently. So the task parallel library is about simplifying concurrent and asynchronous code, which kind of groups these two paradigms together, both asynchronous programming as well as parallel programming. We get this bucket that we can use to you know, use all these principles, which is great. So what's a task all about? A task is a way for us to introduce an asynchronous process. If we write task.run and then we have an anonymous method here, we can start a lot of work and do that on 
we, I don't want to say a separate thread, but it's most likely going to end up in a separate thread. But when we talk about tasks, we don't want to talk about different threads because we don't know where that is running. All right, so what I don't want you to do here now is go into your apps and just wrap all the synchronous code in task.run and have that work asynchronously because that's going to end up giving you a lot of headache. And hopefully after this session, you'll know why. So this is a simple way for us to just offload a lot of work. We're starting off an asynchronous operation that's going to run some work on a separate thread. And then we have a separate, another way of doing this. We can say that we have an asynchronous operation that will, in, when it's done, give us some data back. So the first one could be just go ahead and do some work. The second one could be boil my eggs. And when the eggs are done, I want to receive those eggs back. All right, so let's just have a quick look at what this looks like and a few potential problems that we can get when we're working with tasks. So I have a project here. It's a simple WPF app. Now, asynchronous programming is applicable to all types of .NET apps. We can do this in WPF. We can do it with Xamarin apps. We can do it in ASP.NET, console apps, WinForms, and so forth, which makes it really powerful. But it also means that we need to understand what happens on each different platform. But we'll get into that a bit more later. So all I have here is a button that lets me run something. I have a text block called debug, and I want to click my run button and then have some data added to this debug window here. So let's just look at the code. I'm clicking that button, and what happens is that I, I start off an asynchronous operation. And the message that I'm trying to set on my debug text here kind of indicates what's going to happen here. I'm not going to be able to set anything on that text box. If we run this app, and I click the button, the idea is that I click it, I get into this operation here. It runs this task.run, which starts off an asynchronous operation. This asynchronous operation tries to manipulate my UI. And I click this here, and nothing happens. What happens here is that we've got a problem because we, can no, we cannot invoke the UI from a different thread. So this asynchronous operation ended up being in a different thread, but I didn't get notified that there was a problem. Normally, when we try to do things that we are not allowed to, we get an exception. So where's the exception in this case? I have a reference to the ongoing operation here. So what I can do is that I can introduce something called a continuation, which lets me check if the task that just completed is faulted. And if it's faulted, I can do something properly, right? So if we set a breakpoint in here, the asynchronous operation completes. We're getting to a place called a continuation, which, which is a state that tells us that the task completed. We can take care of any potential results. I'll click the button. And we'll see here that it's faulted. And then we got an exception. So I want you to remember this here, that when we get an exception on one of our tasks, that's going to be swallowed by that task itself. So a lot of times, we might have asynchronous operations that fail silently, which means that our apps might look like they behave like they should. But in fact, there's things that might be crashing on different threads and different tasks that we're not taking care of. So in this case here, what we would have to do is that we'd have to properly handle this here. And this starts to get a little bit messy, because now we end up having a different method here that has to check this task here. If it's faulted, then we need to go back and do something else, and it just gets a bit messy. The proper way of doing this, if we want to invoke the UI, if we want to avoid having this problem up here, what we can do is that we can, inside the continuation, for instance, we can use something called the dispatcher, which is something that's available on pretty much any platform that allows you to do asynchronous operations. It's a way for us to communicate back with the original thread. So we can talk with, in this case, the UI thread. Or in you know, ASP.NET, we can use the thread that's executing our, upper, our web request. So if I start this again here, we'll see that I'll be able to set that from this different thread, which sets the message to done. So if I use the dispatcher, I can invoke the UI thread, which is great. So what I want you to remember from this here is that tasks tend to swallow exceptions. And we need to validate that those tasks didn't get any exceptions. And if they did get exceptions, we need to handle that properly. 
but it could end up getting a little bit messy. So in order for us to streamline the work with asynchronous programming, we want to introduce more helpers in our programming language. So we want to introduce async and await. And we want to do that because it's pretty hard working with asynchronous programming. If we need to look at the state for, states for all our tasks and we need to keep track of all the errors and need to do all that ourselves, our applications are going to be bigger and a little bit messier, even though the task parallel library has been around since .NET 4 and helped us a lot along the way to solve these problems, it's still not really there to make our applications be more maintainable. So what they did was they introduced async and await, which is pretty much just two contextual keywords. That means that they don't change the runtime. It means that our applications will just have a different compilation step so the compiler will see that we use the async and await keywords, and they'll just add a bunch of code for us and solve all these complexities for us. Actually, what happens is that they hide our complexity. Since it's so hard to work with async and await and asynchronous programming and parallel programming, it's still complex. We just hide the complexity somewhere else, which means that we still need to understand this complexity and what it means to add these different keywords. But if they hide the complexity from our apps, that means that we get more readable code, which ends up being hopefully more maintainable. If we apply async and await properly in our apps, and if we are doing that efficiently, it means that our apps are going to be more readable and hopefully more maintainable. But hiding complexity, and a lot of the times when I work on a pro program that's applying these principles, I work with developers that don't always know what to do with the async and await keyword. For instance, myself, when I started out, I applied the async keyword to a method and just hoped that, well, now it's asynchronous. It's going to be running somewhere else, right? That's not going to happen, which means that when, even if our applications look more readable, it's going to be more error prone, which means that we're going to end up having more deadlocks. And it's even simpler to get a deadlock with async and await than it is with tasks. You actually have to do a little bit of hard work to deadlock an application when you're simply using tasks. But when you're using async and await, it's super simple to deadlock an app. And if the tasks swallow our exceptions, that means that we might not always know if there's a deadlock. Right? So what does it look like adding these two keywords? These two keywords are always used together. At least that's the, the intention, right? I don't always see them used together, but when they're not, that's incorrect. You want to use these two keywords together in the same context. So for instance, what we do here, the first thing that we do to make something asynchronous is to mark our method in the method signature to say that the intention of this method is that it's going to run asynchronously. And how does it know and how does it work with asynchronous programming? If that keyword doesn't make this method asynchronous, then what does? We have the await keyword down here. That's where pretty much all the magic happens. There's a lot of things happening with both of them, but when we add the await keyword, we are indicating that there's some asynchronous operation going on. I have a two-second delay here that's running somewhere else. It could be my egg boiling process. So what I'm saying here is that, well, now that we have this egg boiling here, I want to pause here. And before we go on to the next step, before we do the debug.writeLineX line x here, I want to wait for this egg boiling process to finish. So these two together is what makes it asynchronous. These two together with the tasks it's what makes this magic happen. So I said that it's going to wait here, but that's not really accurate. It's not going to be sitting here waiting, blocking the app until it's done. It's going to continue executing the app from where you call this method. So we'll look at that, an example of that in just a moment to make, more, to make it like a bit more clear. So the await keyword kind of marks something called a continuation. So you saw before where I did the t1.continue with, and then I could capture any potential problems. The await keyword does the same thing. But it also does a lot of other magic. It checks if there's an exception on our tasks. If there's a problem on the task that we just executed, the await keyword will, in fact, make sure that we throw that exception back to the caller or set it on the, the task that's currently running. But what it's also doing is that when we see the await keyword, it returns back to the caller with a reference to the ongoing operation, or the ongoing work. So that means that when we see the 
await keyword, it's going to return back to where the caller called our asynchronous method and then continue with the next line after that. So there's complexity and stuff happening behind the scenes here. So remember, I said there's no changes in the, run, in the runtime. That means that all this logic is bundled with your app. And if you're using this incorrectly, you're going to end up having a problem in your applications. So what's the difference between using the await and task.continue with? Except the obvious that the exception will be thrown back to the caller. There's also a few other differences. The first one here, we are simply doing continue with, and then we're writing out to the debugger. But in that case here, if we try to invoke our UI, we would get a problem. We wouldn't be able to do that. It's also looking a little bit more messy. In the second example here, we have the await keyword to indicate that I want every, all the code beneath here to be in something called a continuation. But the cool thing here is that we are now back to the caller thread. So these two are so different that in the first case, we cannot invoke the UI because we're on a different thread. But in the second one, we are back to where we called the asynchronous operation from, which could potentially be the UI thread. All right, so what's the bad things about async and await? What makes this, you know, it sounds like it's awesome. It makes our application more readable. It hides complexity that we don't know, don't want to handle ourselves. But, you know, that's one of the problems. It increases the complexity of the apps. And if we don't have a great understanding of what happens when we add those keywords, for instance, what's generated when we add the async keyword? What happens when we add the await keyword into our method? If we don't know that, it's pretty easy for us to get problems. And that's what makes it hard to master. Like, I've been working with asynchronous programming for a long time now. I've done a lot of talks about async and await. And every time I learn something new, every time I tend to deadlock an app or I do something that, you know, I get a, a fun experience out of it as well, which is great. That means that deadlocks are just around the corner. So I want to show you this app here that we worked on. So what we could potentially do inside this app here, instead of having these tasks in here, let's move this over to a different method. So in the example code that I had, what I had was that I had a public async task run async, var x is equal to 10, and then we had await task.delay, two seconds, and then we could potentially do something after this here. So let's say that we want to return some data here. So how do I return something from an asynchronous method? Well, task is a generic type, so I could say that when this is done, it's going to return a string. And we can call this up here. Just want to prove a point here. When we call this here now, what happens is that first it's going to run, run async. It's going to, we click the button, it goes into run async. It declares the variable x is equal to 10. It sees that we are now using the await keyword. We start off an asynchronous operation that will run for two seconds. And then it says here that, well, I don't want to do anything after this line until you are done. So what happens? It goes back to whoever calls this method. It goes up here, and then it goes to the next line. And once it's completed, once those two seconds are up, It'll come back and it'll set the value hello world as a result on the task that we're returning here. All right, so this is normally where people start to get a headache, and that's totally fine. So in order for us to get the value hello world here, so I don't want to continue to this, this line down here. In order for us to get the value out of run async, I need to introduce another await keyword. That means that I need to mark my run click here as async. And I'll wrap this in a try and catch block. Does anyone know why I wrap this in a try catch block? Because I don't want to throw any exceptions. So the reason I do that, seriously, is though because this is marked as async void. And I'll show you a sneak peek of the state machine soon. Oh, did you just say that? Yes. Oh, 
sorry. <laughs> um, yes, so the reason is because it's async void. Uh, and I'll show you the state machine later on and what happens. So to get the value out of run async now, I'll have to use the await keyword. So when I use await here, I mark a continuation, which means that it won't continue doing anything else before it gets that value. And once the task is done, what the await keyword here will do is that it will validate that we had no exceptions. So if we throw an exception in here, it'll, know, it, it'll see that, and we would be in the catch block here, right? It also fetches our result from that asynchronous operation. So the await keyword does a lot of things for us, which is great. And now I could say debug.txt is equal to result. Because remember that we are now back to the caller thread. So hopefully if I run this here, after two seconds it should say hello world. Right? So I didn't have to introduce any dispatchers. I didn't have to do the dot continue with. I just had to get an understanding of what happens when. Right? I had to understand what applying the async keyword does and what using the await keyword, um, how that changes our application. But the cool thing here is that I don't have to worry too much about cross-threading. All right. Let's talk about the state machine. So the state machine is pretty much what's making all the magic happen. That's where all the great things go. All the complexity goes into the state machine. And that's also what makes this application a, li a little bit more fragile. So state machine is pretty much like a child when you're going on a long vacation, you're sitting in your car, you're driving somewhere, and you have a child in the back seat asking you, are we there yet? That's pretty much a state machine. So the state machine keeps track of what we're doing, when we're doing what, and it's continuously asking us if we're ready to go to the next step. It's nagging our application all the time, asking us, are we done yet with this asynchronous operation? It also handles potential errors and results, which means that inside the state machine, what happens is that it will actually capture any exceptions that are being thrown inside a task, and it will know how to handle that properly. It also takes care of executing the code after the await keyword. So it's executing all the code in the continuation block. All right, so that sounds pretty cool. So how do we get this state machine? This state machine is generated when we apply the async keyword. So whenever we mark a method as async, it pretty much takes the entire method body of that method and moves, moves it into somewhere else and applies a lot of complexity to that code. So I have this example here. This is pre-compilation. So this is something I wrote in, in Visual Studio. I have this method marked as being async. I have some continuation down here at the bottom, which is writing out something to the debug.write line. Now, when I compile this here, normally we can just open this up in Reflector and have a look at that. And that's exactly what I did here. So what happens was that it changed the entire behavior of my method. See here that it removed the async keyword from the method signature because we, we cannot change the calling convention, right? Because we cannot change the, the runtime. It's only something that changes during compilation. It introduced something called run async d underscore underscore one, which is the state machine. So it instantiates that and creates a reference to the state machine. And then here at the bottom, we return a task. This is a reference to the ongoing work. So I don't know if you noticed, but in this case here, we don't have a return statement. And up until now, I didn't mention why we don't have a return statement. It just magically compiles, and that's because we have the async keyword. So as soon as we add the async keyword, we'll automatically get a task returned, as we can see here at the bottom. So we get a reference to the ongoing work in the state machine. All right? So if we dig in deeper into the state machine, it's running sort of an internal loop. It's checking if we're done with the asynchronous operations. And if we drill into that, we'll get into some code looking like this here. So this is, in fact, the code that we had in our run async method. We can see here that we have the task.delay starting that off. We can see that it has the x is equal to 10 on the line above that. 
So it's moving all our code and it's splitting it up into smaller pieces and putting it in the right place inside the state machine. If it's not completed, it goes out to the outer loop and runs that again and asks us again if it's done. But then when we are done, when we are finally ready to handle the result, when we are in the continuation, we are back at the line at the bottom. So there's no magic here. There's nothing going back to the caller thread. There's no references to the caller thread here. So how come this runs on our UI thread? It's because the entire state machine runs on the thread of the caller, which means that if the UI thread spawns off an asynchronous method, if we mark something as async, that entire method will run on that thread. All right? So keep that in mind. This entire block is executed on the caller thread. That's super important. And we'll see why soon. All right, so async void is a problem. So I like to talk about how I stand in line to get an ice cream during summer, but being from Sweden and now being in London, most of us don't know what a sun looks like, or going to the beach for that matter. But async void is like, like just imagine, just imagine going to the beach, it's a hot day, you're standing in line for 40 minutes with your kids, you're trying to get an ice cream, you're the last one in the line, you buy the ice cream, the truck closes, drives away, and then you drop the ice cream in the sand. That's how I feel every time I see async void. I wanna lie down and cry because it hurts my feelings. So is it really that bad? Well, obviously, because I wanna lie down and cry, but if we look at this example here, we're doing an async void run async, what could be the potential problem here? If we compile this here, it'll end up looking something like this here. It looks pretty much the same like the other one that we decompiled. The only difference is that we no longer have a task that's being returned here. There's nothing that returns anything at the bottom here. And internally, it's using a totally different way of creating our state machine. It's using th something called the async void method builder, which is a separate way of creating the state machine for a void method. So why is this a problem? Why is it a problem that we don't get a reference to the ongoing work? If we don't have a reference to the ongoing work, how would we know if there's a problem? How do we know if there's an exception? You know, if I ever buy a car that's written in .NET, I want to make sure that they don't do async void, because we'll end up like this here. So let me show you what happens. Look at these two. Um, we have tr this try catch block here. We're calling run async. This application works, right? What happens if we, let's just re remove the return from here. So, and still call that method. So we'll simply do await run async. And inside run async, we're going to throw an exception. And I'm going to mark this as async void. Does anyone know what's going to happen now? First thing is that, you probably know what's going to happen. Um, first thing is that I can no longer use the await keyword. That's problematic. So now I have no way of saying, well, I want to wait for that operation to run. But since the method signature doesn't indicate that it's an asynchronous operation, I have no idea that it's asynchronous. I have no idea that it's now something that's going to run somewhere else. So we have to remove the await keyword first. All right. That doesn't seem too bad, right? I'm wrapping that in a try and catch block. How about we put a breakpoint here and see what happens if I run this? I'm going to click the button. And I got an exception. That's great. But the application crashed. Let me run that without the debugger. Look at that. The application simply crashed, which is a bit problematic. I have the, met I have the method call inside a try catch block, but there's no way for me to catch the exception. Because this is marked as async void, what happens is that inside the state machine, it sees that we don't have a task that's currently a reference to the ongoing operation. So what's the next best thing to do? Well, let's tear down the application. Let's tear down the app domain. There's no way for us to recover from this. So if you mark something as async void, there's no way for us to catch those exceptions. So why would we allow us to do async void? 
it's because of event handlers. Because we can't go ahead and change all the delegates for all the event handlers, right? So the problem is we have no way of catching those types of exceptions. So how do we make sure that we don't throw any exceptions in here? Don't do too much things inside your event handlers. Because if you have, like, you handle unhandled exceptions in your app, you won't be able to catch that either, which is problematic. So just make sure you build applications that never throw, throw any exceptions if you have to use async void. Or it's probably easier to just avoid async void. All right, so the way that we fix this is simple. We simply change void to task. But then what happens is that we need to await that in the caller, because now we change the behavior of the app. All right? Let's talk a little bit more about efficiency. How can we build apps that behave a little bit more efficient, and how can we be more efficient? Now that we have an understanding of what is asynchronous programming, how do we apply that in our applications? What's the difference between using continue with and using await? How, what does the state machine do internally? We can probably think a little bit ahead and think about the efficient parts of async and await. So one way to be efficient is to avoid deadlocks. So remember before that I said it was probably a little bit easier before to make deadlocks? Oh, sorry, it's easier now to do deadlocks. Prior to async and await, it was a little bit more difficult. You had to do a little bit of work. Here's a little bit of an example. So in this case here, I'm simulating a one millisecond worth of load, right? So I'm doing some work for one millisecond. After that, I would want to continue with something. Dispatcher here tries to invoke the UI. Notice this one here at the bottom. So remember before I said, it's important to remember that the state machine runs on our caller thread. And we'll get to that soon. But in this case here, we're blocking just as if this was running on the UI thread, right? So here we are blocking our UI thread, and then we're trying to invoke our UI thread. Actually, what it's doing is that the wait keyword here will say, I want to force us to wait on this thread until the asynchronous operation is done. The asynchronous operation says, well, I can't be marked as done until I can communicate back to the UI thread, which kind of ends up in a deadlock. We're locking the UI thread until it's done, and it's trying to communicate with the UI thread to be completed. All right, so this looks a bit tedious. How many of you have seen this before? Probably not so many. But with async and await, all we need to do is this. So why is this a lot easier with async and await? Isn't it supposed to be harder to get bad applications with async and await? In this case here, what we're doing is that we are starting off our run async method. Remember, the async furnace state machine for the async operation is running on the caller thread. This loop that's continuously asking us if it's done, it's running on our caller thread. And then we're blocking the caller thread. We're blocking the same thread that executes the state machine. So whichever task it's awaiting inside itself cannot communicate back to tell us that it's done, which means that we end up in a deadlock. And there's no way for us to recover from this. So what do we take away from this? Never use the wait keyword. Never do dot result, never do dot wait, never use task dot wait all, for instance. If you avoid those things, you'll have a harder time getting a deadlock. Okay? So don't do wait. Another thing I like to talk about when I mention efficiency is the overuse of unnecessary state machines. That sounds a little bit weird, so imagine this case here. This is a legit code here that I'm marking something as async, it returns a task, I have a continuation, it's calling some internal method that's being marked as async. I have this other thing that's also awaiting something that's being async, which is then in its turn awaiting something that's being async, which in its turn is, yeah, you get the drill. What happens if we do this? Well, probably not something good. So I have that code in here, the exact same one. I have a run async method here, which calls something internal, which is marked as async, which is calling something that's marked as async. They're all using the async and await keyword. 
If I compile this here, I'm going to set that up, start a project, I'm going to go ahead and go into Reflector. And hopefully I've got this loaded here at the bottom. So we'll see what this looks like. Now, I got a state machine for run async, which makes sense, because we have a continuation. We need to invoke the UI or do something in that method. But then we have a state machine for run internal and something async and something internal async. So the problem here is that each of these methods in here, they all got their separate state machine. We got a state machine here because we marked this as being async. We got a state machine here because we marked this as being async. So why is that bad? <coughs> if we run this on a desktop application or in ASP.NET, we probably wouldn't bother changing this or fixing this because it wouldn't impact efficiency. But when we run this in Xamarin, for instance, or on a mobile device, every CPU cycle counts. Every time you run a line of code, that's going to drain battery. So we need to think about those things when running on mobile devices. So what we do here, how do we change this to be a little bit better? Well, we can first off, we can start by removing the async keyword. But now we broke something, because now we can compile because we have the await keyword. So how do we fix this without changing our signature or changing the behavior? We replace await with return. So all we do now is that we move our task to the caller. So the caller can now await this task by itself. And then we do the same thing for all of them. except the first one. All right, so I'm going to return all of them, which is pretty much going to be the exactly same task, exactly the same task. Instead of having three different or four different state machines that each of them take care of their internal tasks and work with those um, pretty expensive operations, I only have a state machine here at the top, which is run async, because the only time you want to use async and await is when you do something in the continuation when you do something after the await keyword. Otherwise, you can just return that task to the caller. If I compile this here, go back to Reflector, all of a sudden, we only have one state machine, and all of the other ones are just calling or just returning those tasks. Because remember, each of the state machines introduces complexity, and they make it harder for us to work with. So if we don't need to do anything inside our, inside our continuation, we don't need to use the await keyword. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't return the task back to the caller. So we don't want to break the chain, right? We don't want to call something that's asynchronous, and then all of a sudden, that thing blocks whatever it's calling down the line. So we want to do async all the way, which means that if we have an asynchronous method at the top or at the bottom, we want to return that task all the way through the, the funnel. So this is what the complete example of that would look like. All right. Another thing that I like to talk about when talking about efficiency is how we cancel tasks. Cancellation is something that I often feel that it's left out of talks about async. Imagine that I have this long running operation here. It's combining a, little, a few different things. It's a while true loop. The idea is that we want to run this on a different thread or a different uh, context. It's going to run forever. And the, we have a dispatcher here that invokes our UI. Pretty much just increments or shows us the ticks, right? And then we await something for 500 milliseconds in each of these iterations. How do we cancel this task here? When I call this operation here, what I could do is that I could pass something called a cancellation token. So in this case here, I, I create something called a cancellation token source. That lets me indicate to a task that it should complete or that it should cancel. So what I'm doing here is that I start off an asynchronous operation, which wraps my long-running operation async. What this is doing is that since this method here, if we go back here, this is marked as async, which means that we have a state machine. It's running a state machine for this entire thing because we have the await keyword down here at the bottom. Wrapping this with a task, like I'm doing here, takes that state machine and runs it on a different task, hopefully a different thread. All right? And then I'm passing the cancellation token to that, as we see here at the end. So I'm passing the cancellation token, which lets me call cancellation token .cancel. So how many of you think that by just calling this here, it's going to cancel the operation? One. 
That's excellent, because nothing's going to happen. So why is nothing happening? Well, imagine what would happen if the framework allowed us to just cancel an operation like that. Like, how does it know where to cancel? If it's currently invoking the UI and we press or click or do cancellation token dot cancel, how does it know where to gracefully cancel this operation? It wouldn't know, right? We have to manually check in here if the cancellation token has a cancel requested. And what we could do if we notice is that there's a cancellation requested, like I'm doing here, we could, for instance, roll back data. We could say that, well, if you cancel here at the bottom, let's say that we just added a record to the database, and then all of a sudden you go ahead and cancel our task. We could roll back the changes in the database. All right? This brings me to something I like to call smart cancellations. This is kind of the mobility edition. So what I've been doing lately is I've been working on a Xamarin project where we don't want to block the UI pretty much at all. We want to allow the user to always enter data into the app, but we want to wait until the user is done. So how do you do that? Well, you could, for instance, fire off a task. So let's say that you press a button, and then you fire off a task to say, after 400 milliseconds, for instance, I want you to go ahead and go off and call our web server. But if the user presses another key, we cancel all the running tasks. Right? So that means that if the user keeps pressing buttons, we'll just cancel all the tasks all the time. Of course, there's going to be a little bit of overhead because you need to fire off a task and then cancel them and so forth all the time. But it's a smarter way of doing cancellations. So let's have a look at that. So first of all, I do have a little bit of an example here on Windows for cancellations. So let me run this project. So I can click Run here, and it's going to print out all the text. It's the same example that we saw before. And when I click Cancel, it crashes. Shouldn't do that. Let's just imagine that it, it worked. Let's have a look at the code. So I'm doing the exact same thing here. Um, like we saw in the example, it passes down the cancellation token. It lets us throw this exception here if it's being canceled, and I can catch that in here. So uh, it's probably not. All right. So it's passing that down to that operation. So when I click cancel, it's simply calling cancellation token dot, dot cancel. And then what we can do is that when we call this run async method here, when we click the run button, uh, we can capture any exceptions. So we can capture these task cancel exceptions. So we can then roll back data. So the idea here is that you start off an operation, then you click cancel, and you can capture that, that cancellation just re was re just requested. All right? So let's just go ahead and have a look at what this could look like on Android instead. So I'm going to run this off. I'll show you the code first, because the Android emulator needs to start off. So the idea of smart cancellations. So what I'm doing here, um, one, one, here we go. So what I'm doing, when you start pressing some data, I'm starting off a task.delay. So I'm, wait, I'm, I'm allowing the user four seconds for every keystroke. Um, it could be a, a slower user. We could, for instance, lower that to 400 milliseconds. What happens is that each time I press a button, I want to cancel the ongoing tasks. All right, so if we have a look at what happens. I have a text field called some user data. When the text changes, I call cancellation token source .cancel. That's the same cancellation token that I pass to my task.delay. Right? So that means that every time the user presses a button, I can go ahead and cancel these tasks. So if I set that as a startup project, let's see if this runs. All right. So I write some, date, some text in here. You can see here that it's being canceled. And then after four seconds, hopefully it says something else in here. All right. So every time I press a key here, it goes off and cancels my running tasks. I'll only have one task running at the time, at one time. And the way that I'm checking that if I need to start off a new task 
is that I'm first checking if I have a task, that I have a reference to that ongoing operation. I check, is it null? Is it canceled? Is it faulted? Is it completed? If I've already done all the data, if I've done the request to the backend, and the user starts pressing data again, of course I'm going to restart and send off that operation again. But this is what I like to call smart cancellations. So in this way here, we've built an application that allows us to let the user work with the app without popping up dialogues telling them that, well, you have to wait for the data to load, or you know, adding a button to start load the data from the web or send requests. We can, we can um, in a smart way, find out what the user wants to do. All right. One final thing that I want to talk about is ASP.NET. ASP.NET, as I mentioned before, allows us to use the asynchronous principles as well. We can do parallel programming in ASP.NET. We can do asynchronous programming in ASP.NET. It, it really isn't that much of a difference between ASP.NET and you know, working with any other type of app. One thing that I want to get out of the way straight away, though, is that by simply marking something as async in ASP.NET doesn't mean that we make the client asynchronous. Right? It doesn't mean that it introduces AJAX by default. Might seem obvious, but it might not be. So in this case here, I have a simple web application. I have a simple index action here, which is marked as being async, which means that we need to return a task. Whenever we use the async keyword, we also need to return a task. And once this task has completed, we get an action result. So why would we be able to do this if it doesn't mean that the client becomes asynchronous? It's about relieving resources from IIS and letting the server work on more things at one time. Right? If I run this here, we'll see here that hopefully after a little while it's going to say OK. And all the code did was that it said run async, which is awaiting an asynchronous method that I'm calling in here, which is just delaying for one, sec one millisecond. I could change this to three seconds, restart the app, and then, of course, it would take three seconds before we see that OK text up here at the top. You'll also see that it's still loading the website, right? So it doesn't make it asynchronous by default on the client. It's just asynchronous on the server. Now, it's also super simple to deadlock in ASP.NET. It behaves a little bit differently than in a mobile app. Because what you can do is you can just click F5 in your browser, and it goes off and performs a second web request. So it is a little bit different. But the idea is the same. So what we do here, if I change this back to one again, just to prove that it's quicker, what I have here is I have a method called deadlock. Deadlock calls run async and then simply calls dot wait. And doing that is a big no-no because that means that the thread that is currently processing our web request will wait until the state machine is done, but the state machine is running on that thread, right? So it cannot, can never be done. So if we call slash deadlock, Oops, slash home deadlock. It's, gonna, uh, it's just going to sit here and load forever because it now deadlocked. But if we go back here, I can still refresh this page because it's two different threads handling that process. So after a while, IAS will probably terminate this process, but you never know. I do like to show you how you can block if you really want to but you should never do this at home. So what you can do is that, I kind of hinted this before, but what you can do is that you can take the state machine and run that somewhere else and block the, the UI thread. And the way that you do that is by introducing a task.run, like this here, and then simply call wait on that task itself. So if I run this here, it shouldn't deadlock. But what happens is that we take the run async state machine, we run that somewhere else, and when that's completed, it's going to notify this task here that it's completed. And we are blocking the UI thread until this task is done, and that task can get a notification because it's not being blocked. Make sense? Yes. So your question is, is it better to use configure await false? Yes, always in ASP.NET. So what happens, that's a very good question. So what happens is that in ASP.NET, I don't know if they've changed this in core, but I don't think they have. 
Um, when you use async and await in ASP.NET, what they do is that they try to get back to the caller thread. But in ASP.NET, we don't really care about the main thread or the UI thread. So what we can do is that we can use something called configure await false, which says that whenever you return into the continuation, we don't care which thread you use on the thread pool, which means that the applications are going to be faster because it can just pick any thread available in the pool. All right. So unless you want to be the firefighter, I do recommend that you do async all the way down. So make sure that whenever you use async and await, have async and await all the way down, return tasks from all your methods, which will make it a lot easier for you to work with. It is problematic debugging asynchronous programming because it jumps around to different threads and jumps around to different contexts. But once you have an understanding of what happens in the state machine, you shouldn't have to feel like the firefighter anymore. And if you want to learn more, I have a course on Pluralsight, which you can check out, which goes into this a little bit more in detail, and it's a little bit slower, so hopefully you wouldn't get a headache. All right, let's wrap this up. So what we've talked about is that we can introduce asynchronous programming in our apps, be it console applications or WPF applications or WinForms applications or web applications. We can use the same principles as long as we understand what the state machine is all about, what happens when we introduce the async and await keywords, that's all that we need to do to make better and more efficient applications. And if we have a better understanding of how to apply these principles and how to work with these in different contexts, our apps are going to be a lot better. All right, thank you so much for listening to me. Please do remember to ping me on Twitter if you want a copy of my book, and don't forget to vote on your way out. Thank you. <laughs>